Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Flood Awareness Day. This is the first presentation of today. We will have Diana with FEMA talk about some flood insurance changes that will be occurring um, now and in the future because flood insurance constantly changes. And if you have any questions, please save them for the end. And um, I'm sure Diana would love to help you out with any of them. I will. I do have to go down at five o'clock. So I'll be quick so we have plenty of time for questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sam, for inviting me uh, to share a little bit of time with, uh, with Miles City and uh, to talk about risk rating 2.0 equity and action. So the NFIP is under transformational change right now. Uh, we, the first step that we've done is the insurance rates. Uh, we're also looking to update our, our uh, floodplain management regulations. We're also going to be working uh, with our uh, mapping to bring it uh, into, uh, uh, into up and up, up some more. Um, but this is going to happen over time. Uh, the first thing we did, like I said, is, is the rates. And for decades, our premium collection um, has been, um, has not been adequate, has not been equitable, has not been rated according to the risk. So Congress has directed us to change that um, and uh, to be more fiscally sound. So risk rating 2.0 is the beginning of that process. For 50 years, we've been rating flood insurance policies based on antiquated and inequitable methods. Take the preferred risk policy, which we it's about 49% of our almost 5 million policies are rated as a preferred risk. Um, they were instituted in 1989 um, as an incentive to write more flood insurance policies, but at a premium rate that was unsustainable. The grandfather rule allowed us to rate a risk based on old mapping data, not on current risk, and so on and so on. So other transformations will occur over the next couple of years, um, but these changes that are coming forward, new policy forms, uh, we should have actually the single family policy form coming out here before the, uh, probably before the end of the year, but a lot of these changes take regulatory activities, which means we have to go through uh, filing them on the federal register, making sure that they are compliant with federal law, uh, comments, uh, revisions, things like this, um, and this could take this could take several years for us to update that information. Um, we'll be um, so it's a new and exciting time for all of us on the flood business. I've been doing uh, flood insurance since the mid '70s, as I was an agent down in uh, New Orleans, and of course at that time all lenders required. Uh, flood insurance on all properties that they made loans on. So it was relatively easy to write a policy at that time. There weren't rate tables, you know, um, it was one rate uh, uh, per building. Uh, so, so what have we discovered in our analysis? Um, we found that inequities exist in our pre-firm structures, that those business uh, those built before mapping uh, or regulations in a community were paying a higher rate than some should have been. Larger homes were not paying their fair share for the risk, um, just to name two. Uh, and risk rating 2.0 will fix that over time. Uh, and rating uh, will now be what we call risk-based. Um, and we'll be using 15 variables and data sets um, that are and have been used by the insurance industry for years, plus the usage of some of the data sets that our flood hazard mapping um, involve and our sister agencies, including the Corps of Engineers. New business policies started October 1. Uh, we also allowed any existing policyholders um, with their uh, renewal from October 1 to March 31st to be able to take advantage of lower premiums, uh, if that was what the risk rating 2.0 uh, premium determination uh, put it to be. Um, and, if, and it was to their advantage to do that. Otherwise, renewals began on, Octo on, uh, on April 1st, and they will go for, um, uh, go until 
um, March 31st of 2023. And that's, we'll be, we'll be looking at the 4.9 million policies that we have out there. I'm running them through the risk rating uh, engine that we have out there. All right, hang on a minute. Let me see if I can page down. No, for some reason, it's not working. Let's see. Hang on. Hmm. There we go. There we go. Um, all right. So let's talk about what's staying, what's going, what's changing. So three buckets. They're very big buckets. What are we not changing at the moment? We are not changing policy forms. We are in the process of uh, putting more policy forms out there than just the three, the dwelling, the general property form and the residential condominium building association policy. So we're gonna be doing a, a single family structure. We're going to be doing a, a multifamily. We're gonna be doing a contents policy for renters. Um, so as we get through the regulatory process, we'll be bringing those uh, online um, as, as, they, as they come out. Coverages are not changing. The limits of liability are still for a residential structure, $250,000. For a non-residential structure, $500,000. Mandatory purchase requirement is not changing. Those are still going to be based on the flood insurance rate maps and the flood zones in which the, the structures uh, lie. Statutory discounts and caps, these are still there. Uh, newly mapped policies are, is, has a statutory uh, a discount. Pre-firm structures, those built before the flood insurance rate map, they have, they're getting a statutory discount. And there are caps. We can only increase policy premiums a certain amount depending on the occupancy of the building. Floodplain management regulations are not changing. Yes, we have put out a request for uh, information uh, on what we need to change, update uh, in our floodplain management regulations. But again, that's gonna take regulatory process and that's gonna take a couple of years for us to update any floodplain management regulations if we even update anything. Uh, they're evaluating those, uh, uh, that information that has been uh, requested from stakeholders uh, in updating their policy. Um, so what is going? Preferred risk. Uh, that's those policies that had a special rating, not actuarially sound, not fiscally sound. Um, and uh, for the risk, uh, we're not um, adequate. The premium was not adequate for the risk. Grandfather, we are no longer using that. Uh, we're getting rid of our mortgage portfolio protection program. That was where we provided policies to mortgage companies uh, under the NFIP banner uh, for their compliance requirements. We are no longer rating based on flood zone or base flood elevations for, uh, for rating purposes. We still use them for floodplain management uh, regulations. Um, so if you're going to build on the floodplain, you've got to follow the community's floodplain management requirements, that's not changing at this time. So here's what we are changing. Um, we are changing uh, our full risk premium communication. So we uh, eventually all policies will be rated based on a full risk premium. How much premium for the factors, the variables that apply to that specific structure instead of pooling um, uh, flood zone information and looking at the lowest floor versus the base flood because there's so many other things that cause flooding that we've not taken into consideration. We're looking at, we are changing uh, the building elevation, uh, the way we look at the building elevation. We used to use flood zone versus, I mean, lowest, lowest floor versus base flood elevation. We found that does not adequately portray the risk for that individual structure. And we'll talk about those risk factors and how we're going to be using those. But now we're using, we're going to be using the lowest adjacent grade to the first floor above ground. 
So we're, we, we are looking at basements, enclosures, and crawl space under a different rating factor other than building elevation. We're giving mitigation credits. Uh, we, are, uh, we are allowing, if you elevate uh, machinery and equipment, we're giving uh, uh, a discount for put flood openings without regard to flood zone. So those structures that are in BC and X zone that are on a crawl space or an elevated building with an enclosure, you can put in flood vents that allow the water to go in and out um, to, uh, to reduce the pressure put on those foundations. We're looking at flood, uh, the number of floors and the unit floors. So we, you know, the higher you go, the lower the premium um, and, uh, and the lower the risk. So we're now looking at number of floors. Construction type, we found in our analysis that, that and insurance companies have been doing this for years, um, uh, frame structures suffer more damage than masonry structures. Um, so we're, we're using that as one of our variables. We're looking at replacement costs. Larger homes who have a higher risk for higher claims um, opposed to uh, smaller homes where the replacement cost is much lower. Those bigger homes are going to have larger claims. So we're, we're looking at that. We're changing the way we look at prior claim, prior flood insurance claims. Uh, in some areas of the country, that is, those are, those are quite high where it floods over and over again. Community rating system. Uh, right now, the community rating system um, only applies a higher discount to special flood hazard areas. We're changing that. That discount is gonna now apply throughout the community without regard to flood zone. So staying, policy forms. Our, um, uh, our uh, dwelling that covers one to four families right now, uh, our, our other, our, sorry, our um, general property policy that covers five families or more and your commercial buildings, state buildings, city buildings, things like that. Coverages, we're, we're not changing. That takes congressional ac action to increase those limits of liability. You know, we're, we're $20 billion in debt because we paid claims over the past, you know, uh, 20 years, starting with big claims, starting with Katrina, Rita, uh, Maria, um, Harvey, all of those, um, all those areas that have, have suffered a lot of flood damage. Um, our, um, we are updating a little bit of language, and we did that um, in October of last year. Uh, we call it Bundle 1. They're in the Federal Register. We just cleaned up some language. We did not make sub substantive changes to the coverages. We just, you know, period here, uh, comma there, uh, some information uh, on flood in progress was updated. Um, and then um, our, our building and contents and IC, ICC coverages, those aren't changing. Again, that requires um, congressional action for us to have higher limits. Is that gonna happen in the future? We don't know. Uh, right now, Congress has a couple of bills um, that are out there that they're looking at to update some of the coverages, whether they're gonna get past this legislative session or not, I, I don't know. Um, but stay tuned. We'll, we'll let you know when they do. Um, so, um, and, and, and what's staying? As I said, the mandatory purchase that is still going to be based on our flood insurance rate uh, maps out there for um, uh, if you're in a special flood hazard area, beginning with the letter A, uh, and you've got a federal mortgage, flood insurance is going to be required for the life of that mortgage. Um, our discounts, our floodplain management regulations um, remain the same based on flood zone, based on elevations. Um, however, we just finished that public con uh, con uh, comment period. So, you know, once we analyze that, we'll make a determination as to whether or not we need to make any changes on Sam's side of the, of the program uh, when it comes to uh, floodplain management regulations. We just don't know really right now. Um, so we talked about the statutory discounts. Those are going to continue 
um, and appropriate statutory rate uh, caps will continue on existing policies. So again, this comes to us from legislation. So we can't not we cannot increase a let's talk take a newly mapped policy. We can't increase um, those premiums more than fifteen percent. We can't increase an average of eighteen percent. There are on any flood policy, existing flood policy, I should say. There are four categories, occupancy categories that go at a twenty five percent rate based on. Um, based on congressional action. Those are non-primary, non-residential, uh, substantial damage, substantial improvement that have not been mitigated, and then severe repetitive loss. Um, so those are those go at an annual increase of 25% until they reach that full risk premium. Once they re reach that full risk premium under any of those categories, the, those, those percentages go away. We no longer increase them when we have an actuarial rate based on that risk uh, under risk rating 2.0. So preferred risk are going, um, uh, rating uh, based on flood zones, base flood elevations, uh, preferred risk um, uh, using the same rating characteristics um, as a as a special flood hazard area, you know, no coverage and deductible limitations. Uh, so, you know, they were packages uh, that we had that you could buy and you couldn't make any, you, you couldn't customize that. Now you can. So you, you know, con if you have a preferred risk policy, you can contact your agent and say, hey, I wanna have a different deductible or I wanna have more contents coverage than the preferred risk allowed me to have. So you can you can customize your coverage now. The other thing we're increasing based on $1,000 a base, not based on 100. Um, so, you know, it, it's just an easier way for us to, uh, to rate a flood policy. Flood zone doesn't drive our rating um, anymore, um, with a, the exception of two rate, uh, rate zones, and that is AR and A99. And that has to do with um, those two flood zones have to do with decertified or levees that are under reconstruction. Uh, we don't have those currently in uh, in any of our any of states for my region, uh, which are Montana, um, Montana, Wyoming, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Colorado, and Utah. So we don't have any of those in our uh, in our specific um, area. To, to, to do with. Uh, last time I dealt with them, that was in Orange County along the LA River Basin in California. And that was, whew, that was 20 years ago. So we've not used it very much. Um, so, um, so we're not having that base flood elevations are no longer used uh, in rating. However, let me say this because we've had a lot of controversy about this uh, and discussion about this in our, in our rating, um, uh, our, our risk rating 2.0 um, training seminars that we've had since the uh, summer of last year and when they're still ongoing. Um, so it is still the higher you go, the lower the premium. So the um, so if you if you've got a one foot or two foot freeboard, um, that's still going to reduce your premium, even though we're not using that base flood elevation. We're looking at that two feet above ground level um, is going to reduce your premium, or three feet above ground level is going to to reduce your premium. So the higher you go, the lower your premium. So keep that in mind as a community. Uh, when you're when you're looking at your floodplain management regulations, but as you know, as as a a builder, as a homeowner that might be building a new structure, um, the the higher you go, the better the premium. So so in the um, in the way we have done policies over the last number of years, we looked at four rating variables. Along with our flood map information, we looked at the rate zone, the base flood elevation, 
the foundation type, whether it was a basement, uh, whether it was a slab on grade, whether it was a split level, you know, things like that. Um, and then we looked at the structures elevation and compared that to the base flood elevation. And that's how we rated a policy. We pulled, you know, but we know that each structure is different, but we didn't treat them that way. Now we are because each structure has its own unique rating variables that we are taking into consideration. We only looked at the 1% chance of flooding, whether it was riverine or coastal. Um, now we're doing more. Um, and then we have our fees and surcharges that again are mandated by Congress for us to charge on a, on a policy for us to be fiscally sound. So under the, under the new uh, uh, pricing methodology, we have fifth, more than 15 variables that we looked at, look at. And that way we can do a more uh, uh, unique or specialized rating for, for each structure. So, and we ha now have the data and the IT to more accurately assess that flood risk and price insurance to better reflect that risk. And it has the capability in, of enabling people to pay the correct premium for their risk, secure adequate coverage, um, and learn better options to mitigate the risks unique to your own structure. So let's discuss what this paradigm shift means to FEMA team members and our partners. Um, so the, the new methodology is to fully appreciate that FEMA's moving away from determining flood insurance premiums using flood zones and base flood elevations. Asking questions like, how would a, a coastal flood zone or a riverine flood zone look under risk rating 2.0? Uh, and to what base flood level should machinery and equipment be elevated above are not particularly meaningful under risk rating 2.0. Although we give a discount if you elevate all of your machinery and equipment up to a, a certain level, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and this is because rating and risk are individually assessed for each building and not determined by flood zones or by base flood elevations. So the new methodology is just is not just a, a minor improvement. It is a transformational leap forward for the program. Um, the, legacy period, the legacy pricing operates by comparing uh, properties to an, a set of national standards. And we know that doesn't really happen when it comes to, when it comes to flood. So, you know, risk rating 2.0 is to better understand the specific flood risk for each NFIP insured building and its surrounding area. So um, the, the bottom line is under this new rating structure, premiums will reflect individual stories of flood risk for each and every policyholder. Um, and each and every policyholder, we can set rates that are fairer, that are more equitable. Um, we can address the inequity that is built up over time in the program of policyholders with lower value homes, subsidizing those um, uh, uh, larger homes and, 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 and having their claims um, not collecting not enough money to, to take care of the claims for those higher valued structures. We now have the capability and the tools to um, to address rating dispar uh, disparities by incorporating more flood risk variables like flood frequency, multiple flood types from uh, rivering flow. Uh, like I said, we used to just do the 1% coastal and the 1% uh, riverine flooding. Now we're doing pluvial flooding. We're doing uh, tsunami flooding. We're doing great. We just completed a major study on the Great Lakes. Um, and, uh, you know, that national standard no longer exists. So now we're rating based on locality for, for, uh, for, that, for the program. Um, so one of the existing inequities, in, so these in, existing inequities must be corrected um, and it's time for us to do that after 50 years of doing it one way and, and 
um, overcharging some, undercharging others, um, so that everybody pays their fair share. And by providing policyholders a clear and concise picture of their, their unique flood, uh, which has never been done before, we're equipping them with the information necessary to make more informed decisions, including mitigation actions. So mitigation coupled with um, insurance provides individuals with the essential tools they'll need to recover after disaster strikes. But it goes without saying, that risk rating 2.0 brings sizable changes to the FEMA organization, and it does. It's important to acknowledge this. And it's also important to acknowledge that risk rating 2.0 brings exciting and improving changes to the, um, to the rating. So in some ways, risk rating 2.0 is shifting how far the vast majority of people will be able to peek under their hood, so to speak, um, and the old method, we don't, we, we don't go into details about how we arrive those numbers and populate each rate table. And Lord, did we have rate tables. Um, we just publish them and they are what they are. So in risk rating 2.0, we similarly do not go into details of every single calculation, but we, what we can do um, within this new rating paradigm uh, is to uh, be sure that we are following good and have a good understanding of the new pricing methodology and to explain how it generally works. So here's the rating variables. Now we're still using our FEMA source data. Uh, so we're still looking at our flood maps and the data that we used behind them to develop those flood maps. But we're also working with our sister agency. So we're working with, the, uh, with NOAA, with USGS, with um, Corps of Engineers to obtain a lot of their information, particularly Corps of Engineers with their levy database. Um, so we're updating and they're updating their dat databases. We provide information to them from our, uh, from our rating variables. Um, so distance to the river, coast, ocean, river, uh, river class. Now, when I started writing flood insurance back in the, in the mid 70s, we had a rating factor. And you may have seen these in some of, your old, um, some of your old maps. We had rating factors A1 to A30. Uh, and what did, the, what did those rating factors mean? Well, what it meant was, what's the difference between the 10% the flood and the 100 year flood? in a certain level of height of, of the, uh, of the water, surface water elevation. So we're kind of going back to that, not, not like it was before, but we're using those rating factors, which we call river class. So if you're close to a river, then, then we're looking at those, those, those variables that affect how the, is this a, is this a, a river for a 1% or is this for a, uh, a, a, um, a, a higher percentage of, um, of risk. A flood type, uh, we've only done the 1% uh, the, uh, chance. Now we're looking at fluvial, which is riverine flooding, as well as rainfall. And we've never looked at rainfall. So if you're behind a levee and, and uh, your flood risk comes from rain, we didn't account for that localized drainage system for us to determine a, a, a risk. Now we are. So for how much water comes down, how does the system react to get it out? And how does that affect the, the flooding risk for that, particular, uh, for that particular area? Ground elevation, first floor height, construction type, foundation type. Uh, we've got six foundation types that we've kind of consolidated um, and uh, so we're looking at slab on grade, basement, uh, elevated building, no enclosure, elevated building with an enclosure, a, uh, a, and things like that. We, we, I think I've got a slide on, on that. Um, and a broader range of frequencies from 10, we can actually go up to a 10,000 year event in our models. Now, do we use that for the normal uh, risk rating that we have? No, but we can do that. If there is a, an event that is at that level, whether it's a 500-year, a 1,000-year 
whatever, we can now go in and model that and, and see what the risk is, um, which we could not do uh, in, in the past very easily. So, so we're getting, here's our data sets that we've purchased. Uh, we've purchased uh, privately from, uh, from companies that are out there and working with, with um, the insurance companies out there. These are not anything new. They've been around for a long time. Uh, CoreLogic being one of the big ones uh, that works with over 800 insurance companies to provide data, rating data to them. So we're using our mapping data. We're, you know, I talked about the Great Lakes analysis that we recently commit, uh, 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 completed and are administering uh, in and around communities on the Great Lakes. We're looking at uh, NOAA's coastal data set. We found in our, uh, in looking at our flood maps and our flood studies for coastal areas that we did not, that, you know, we, a history has shown us that when there are storms that come in on the coast, that water goes in further than what we show in the maps. So we wanted to be sure that we're showing what that, uh, how that inundation goes inland. And we're using NOAA's coastal data set for that. We're talking about the, the CORE's uh, levy database. And then USGS is giving us a lot of our geolocation and our elevation data for the ground elevations. Now, what we've gone out and purchased is proprietary uh, software that the companies are using, uh, looking at catastrophe models, geolocation tools, first floor height tools, building replacement cost tools. Um, so, so all of this information is gone, has gone into what we call a rating engine. And, uh, and that rating engine automatically, without touching uh, the system, um, information that comes off of the application that the agent takes, puts it into this rating system, and in two or three minutes, out pops the, the premium for that, uh, for that unique structure. So, you know, we're trying to make it is easier for the agent to write policies. You know, the old uh, application had like 83 questions on it. Uh, we now have six basic questions. There are a couple of uh, clarifying underneath of those, but it's a lot easier for an agent to write a policy now because he fills out those six questions, puts that into the rating engine that is FEMA's. It is not the company's. Uh, FEMA has it. The, there's an interface between our write your own companies that go uh, that hook into FEMA's through a through an interface, and then a, we put all of these data sets to use in a matter of microseconds. And here comes the here comes the the, the quote back. So we're hoping that agents will sell policies uh, a little better than what they had, um, and and the models that we're using. Um, you know, just give us the magnitude of the flood losses and making sure that we are collecting enough premium to be fiscally sound. Now, are we ever going to be out of debt? Probably not. But uh, we will, for future losses, we'll be uh, collecting un enough premium to pay for that so that, you know, maybe we can pay down a lot of our debt. But you know, it did, you know, with climate change, with the, with the frequent, more frequent, more severe storms happening uh, across this country, uh, flood events. I mean, you can turn on the TV just about any day and, and see a flood event somewhere. So, you, you know, we have to take that, in, have to take that into consideration. So what we are doing is communicating the full risk premium. So now when a policy is goes through risk rating 2.0, it's going to get assessed a premium one of two ways. And we're, dim, we're putting that evidence on the declarations page of that policy. It will tell you what the full risk premium is for that structure. Um, new business that comes into the NFIP immediately goes to full risk rate. For those 4.9 million policies that are going through the renewal process now, we're giving, we're, we, are, we have two options. If the full risk rate is lower than the 
the premium that you paid last year plus the appropriate um, increase um, in a uh, percentage increase in premium, um, we're gonna renew it at that lower rate. If the, um, if the renewal premium plus the, um, plus the percentage increase is higher, then we're just gonna increase that policy based on that percentage increase in that premium. And that will go up every year until it reaches that full risk rate. Once it gets to that full risk rate, those increases go away. So probably the, you know, we've not brought up the question nor have we asked, um, well, what happens, you know, after it reaches full risk, will it never increase? Can't say never, but it will not increase to the percentages that it took to get to that full risk rate. So we may have a cost of living increase that may be two or three or 4%. Uh, some there, you know, right now we're looking at 8% um, uh, cost of living increase based on inflation. Uh, but that's going to that's going to eventually go back down. Uh, so and we're showing that difference. So people know uh, but what how, how long it's going to take them so they can take the premium at 18% and 18% and 18% and judge how long it's going to take to get to that full risk premium. Okay, um, and that's going to be on the declarations page. Um, so building elevation. So we talked a little about this earlier, but let's dive a little bit um, into on, on the changes. Um, first, we want elevation for all policies. Now, do you need to go out and hire a surveyor to get elevation information? No. Um, and it's not just on special flood hazard areas. Now, there still may be a, an elevation certificate requirement for floodplain management, for uh, letters of map change, the LOMAs or the LOMA Fs that LOMA Fs that are out there where properties are exempted from the mandatory purchase. Um, but what we are uh, doing is, is looking at that ground elevation to the first floor above ground level to determine that. And this gives us a better picture of that risk uh, across the country. Second, we're using ground elevation instead of base flood elevation. So uh, an earlier concept uh, to understand. Um, additionally, we're using a new concept called first floor height, as I just said, first floor above ground. Uh, and thirdly, we've simplified that foundation type. It, took, it actually took 85 pages out of our flood insurance manual to less than seven uh, to talk about um, how do we rate a structure with a basement? How do we rate an elevated building on a crawl space? Um, so, you know, our, our, our flood insurance manual used to be this thick and now it's about this thick. So it's helped us on that. And fourth is the changes to the elevation certificate. So we no longer, re we no longer require a, an elevation certificate for rating a policy, okay? There may be an elevation certificate requirement uh, on new construction that your community requires. Uh, that still stands. So uh, work, work uh, for a community rating system. But that information can also be used uh, by the agent to rate that, uh, to check the rating on the policy. It may be that elevation information on that EC it's certified by an engineer or surveyor is better than what our assumptions are going to be in that rating engine. Uh, but uh, what we can do now uh, is allow the under sections E and F of the elevation certificate for the property owner to measure that distance between the ground and that first floor height uh, and send that information to the agent he puts that into the rating engine uh, for that particular policy, and it could reduce the premiums. Not going to increase, but it could reduce it. So it, it allows us more flexibility to grab that first floor height above ground level so that we can accurately rate that, that flood policy. Um, and, and we talked about mitigation credits. There's, there's two that elevated uh, machinery and equipment available 
to all properties, not just those in special flood hazard areas. Um, in, in our legacy system, in some cases, we applied a surcharge if the machinery and equipment was not elevated to the base flood elevation as required uh, for new construction on, uh, uh, in the floodplain management regulations. But in, in 2.0, we're inducing, introducing this um, discount structure um, uh, to encourage elevations. Now, I will tell you, and we'll get to this in, in, in a minute, is single, uh, single family or structures on slab on grade um, kind of get screwed on this discount because it's all or nothing. And if you've got contents coverage, think about the washer and dryer, which is, a, which is mechanical. Um, that would actually have to be in the attic, believe it or not. And we know that's not going to happen. Um, so if you can't elevate content, uh, contents, machinery, equipment, you don't get any, any discount for other machinery equipment to be elevated at or above um, certain levels based on the foundation type. Uh, we already talked about the flood openings. It's a requirement under uh, floodplain management regulations in special flood hazard areas if you've got crawl space that you have one square inch per one square foot of, uh, of elevated, uh, I'm sorry, of openings to equalize that water pressure uh, for that flood water, those flood waters that come in and out. Um, but this never been available, never been a requirement in non-special flood hazard areas in those BCNX zones. Uh, now we're giving that discount and it's up to 5%, I'm sorry, it's 5% for machinery and equipment but for uh, openings, it's going to depend on the size of the structure, how much the discount is. Um, number of uh, number of floors. Uh, we, you know, I um, I talked about this. We've not used this as a rating variable in the past. So you've got, you know, you particularly in apartments or particularly in uh, condominiums, uh, you you might be on the third floor of the condominium. Under the old system, we rated you based on that first floor, um, and that was not equitable. So now we're we are looking at well, what floor is that unit or that apartment on, and we're we're uh, allowing a reduction in premium because, as the, as people have always said, it have to be an act of God for us to get flooded because we're on the third floor. So uh, we're taking that into consideration. Uh, and, and we want to know what floor the unit is on because that risk is different than, than on the first floor. Um, construction type. Uh, used for single family structures only. Uh, frame or, con or uh, masonry, a brick veneer, which is what most of the brick homes um, are built, standard are built to today. That's a frame construction. This would be, you know, a stone house or, a, you know, some of these old buildings have a double wall of brick. That would be a, that would be a, a brick or a masonry construction. Uh, concrete uh, would be a masonry construction. Steel would be an other. Um, and others, unfortunately, are rated uh, using a frame uh, pr a premium on it. Um, and, you know, some common questions uh, from homeowners that, that, you know, we'll see a slight difference in, in loss cost. So, you know, we've included this in, in our, rating, uh, our rating factors. Replacement cost is a new variable for us. We've never used it in the past, although the industry has used it for, for years. Um, e even when I was an agent back in the, in the 70s and, and 80s, it was a factor when it came to your homeowner's policies or your property policies. So, but it's very important for equity reasons. You know, those bigger homes are going to have claims, uh, larger claims and reach those, uh, those $250,000 limits quicker than a, um, uh, quicker than a, a, a smaller, lesser, uh, lesser valued home. Other than that, yeah, you know, it's just important for equity reasons for us to do that. Uh, but we're going to use that for all policy types. 
we will determine the replacement cost uh, from one of those data sets that we had out there. Um, and it, when the when the agent puts runs that through the through the through the rating engine for all other structural types, the agent's going to have to provide that that information for us. Um, we're going to be using that replacement cost tool from CoreLogic uh, in order to uh, to determine that. Um, and a lot of this also has to do with 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 when a claim happens. How do we differentiate? Uh, you, how do how do we be sure that we are rating a policy and we are paying claims uh, based on correct information? Because the policy says the dwelling policy says we'll pay replacement costs, providing uh, that you ensure at least eighty percent of replacement uh, cost uh, in in the coverage <clears throat> or the maximum available, whichever is whichever is less. Um, so, so that's how we would use that in, in our claims. Oop, did I lose it? Sorry. Okay. Hang on a minute. Let me get back to where. Oop, I meant me. Okay. Hang on. I think I'm about done. No, I want to talk just a little bit. I have to go back. I have to go, I have to go back and get back into my PowerPoint. Where is it? I lost it. Um, well, let me just let me just go on without um, without the PowerPoint. Uh, prior NFIP claims. So if there have been Right now, uh, you are a repetitive loss, which affects the, the community rating system discounts. Uh, you are a severe repetitive loss. Uh, if you've got two losses more than the value of the structure in a 10 year period, or if you've got three losses historically, or if you've got four losses, $5,000 or, or, or more, um, you're classified as a repetitive loss property. So, um, and I'm trying to, while I'm talking, I'm trying to find my thing, but I'm not gonna find it. Um, so uh, what we are, are, what we're doing now is we're kind of clearing the slate for, uh, for pr previous losses. And what will happen is when the policy renews under risk rating 2.0, the first loss is forgiven. Okay. At the second loss, we're going to look at a historical um, period of 20 years for the number of claims that were paid, minus that initial risk rating, that initial loss under risk rating 2.0. So it's a little more equitable in there. Those that have had older losses more than 20 years ago, they're kind of getting a break. Um, on their premium, uh, and, and uh, but we're finding that we think that's going to be a little bit better. Now, this is a long-term change um, over uh, for risk rating 2.0. We may tweak a few things uh, once we get through first couple of years um, of it, um, but I don't think this piece is going to change at all. Community rating system. Mile City is in the community rating system. They do things over and above minimum federal standards and they earn points for those. Those points have in the past have been only higher points have been applied uh, to special flood hazard areas. Those that are in those B, C or X flood zones did not enjoy a discount um, particularly under the preferred risk rating or the newly mapped rating uh, structures that we had. Now, uh, once, the, once you reach full risk rate, those, that premium discount is gonna apply community-wide. Okay, that's a good thing. So that even though you know, we haven't in the past looked at non-special flood hazard areas, we are now um, because we find that it is uh, important in a community to show that, hey, we are regulating things that affects not only 
special flood hazard areas, but also non-special flood hazard areas. So we're taking that in, into consideration. Um, so I know, I, I, I know levees are a big issue for you all in and around uh, Miles City. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we are addressing levees under risk rating 2.0. And I'm going to read my notes, uh, uh, my notes on this. Um, so uh, one of the things that we knew was levees, whether they're uh, certified or not, they provide a protection. And that levy protection is taken into consideration under risk rating 2.0. Areas that have certified levies are going to get a higher discount because those meet minimum federal standards to, to allow that discount. But for those levies that are out there that aren't certified or they yet or are, uh, are not high enough, we, uh, we want to give some level of discount for those particular types of levies. And we're, we're doing that. As we gather data from policy information, um, we're sending that over to the Corps of Engineers so they can complete their levy database to be sure that they've got all of those, all of those levies in their, in their database whether they're certified or not. And then they can work on uh, they can work on getting helping getting those certified as as money pers persists on it. Um, so there is a document under if you're more in, if you're interested in more information about the levies, there is a document under risk rating 2.0 uh, that talks about um, levies and risk rating um, th that you know it's I don't know, I think it's 19 pages. It talks about how we're dealing with levies and that was written by our levy experts with FEMA in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers. Um, so, um, so you can go there to find it. So we've partnered with the Corps of Engineers to identify and use credible and consistent available data to reflect the flood risk reduction provided by these levies. Um, it's in the National Levy Database and Levy Screening Tool uh, that's maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have rating factors that um, that we depend uh, that are de determining whether it's a certified levy or not. Uh, where's the levy uh, center line? What's the levy uh, crest profile? These are all things that we look at. Uh, when we're uh, that are in the national levy database, how big is the levy area? Um, what's the overtopping frequency? What's the levy performance? Those are three of the big areas that we we look at factors on on setting rates. Um, and the document that I I mentioned uh, describes how FEMA determined the overtopping frequency and the levy uh, performance for every levy that we have uh, in, the, in the system. Um, so we're able to provide comprehensive um, information on this. And I, I, and I think if you want more information, you can go to that levy uh, thing. And I, cause I wanna stop here for a couple of minutes and see if there are, um, are any questions that we have on this. Question yeah, I've got one question for you. You said okay. you are going to be doing some revised mapping. Is it going to be different dimensional? Is it going to be 2D, 3D, which is more accurate? Uh, you know, that is that is not my expertise. I know they're doing some, some remapping in there. We are trying to move most of our mapping activities into 2D. Uh, whether or not the budget allows us to do that uh, will determine whether or not you get there is a 2D model uh, for for updates or not. Okay, so how much of this risk management or risk rating 2.0? How much do you anticipate this to increase FEMA's revenue? 
You know, we really don't know the answer to that right now because we didn't take 4.9 million policies and re-rate them. We, we just didn't do it. Uh, we're, we're looking at it, uh, you know, as we go through the renewal cycle. Um, we may be able to answer that question next year or the following year after we get through the, the rating cycle. Um, but right now, we, that, has not been dis, that has not been determined. Um, but we're not looking at, yeah, we're looking at having enough revenue to pay claims. We're looking more at the equitable, equitability, equi, equity in rating a flood policy on a specific structure, because that's what we have been instructed to do. Now, we actually started this back in 2016 before equity even came into the federal government as a discussion. We started this because we knew when we when we looked at our policies that that these inequities were out there and it's not fair to the policyholders. So we want to have a, a a product that we can give that is that looks at the risk for that structure. Now, ask me that question in two years. Well, I'm going to retire next year. Ask FEMA that question in 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 two years. We might be able to give you. Uh, give you an uh, an acceptable answer. I have one last question, and I'd yes. like I'd like you to take this question to Miss Criswell. What is FEMA doing about fraud and waste on all their claims, such as Katrina, New Orleans? Um, it's been reported and documented the millions and millions of dollars that have been squandered on these disasters? So I'm, I'm quickly gonna answer that because I only have less than a minute. Yes, we when, we when Katrina hit and we knew the extent of the flooding and the, uh, the limited resources that we had in the, uh, in the adjusting community out there, we know we could not, we knew we could not reach each and every policyholder within the within that area, and uh, in a, in a short period of time. So we went to an electronic type of estimate and paid claims based on that. Right or wrong it is not the is not the question. We paid claims. Were there fraud claims paid? Absolutely. And in many cases, we actually went against uh, the, uh, uh, the US Attorney's Office, went and collected and recouped a whole bunch of money uh, because of that. Um, so, but did we get it all back? No. But we learned a lesson that we, we need to be a little more cognizant of this type. Now, if you know of any fraud, that is, that is out there. There is an 800 number, is a toll-free number uh, that you can call to report that. And uh, the, um, the inspector general's office will look at that. And if they find that there is evidence of fraud, they will turn that over to the U.S. attorneys. Take, take that question to Ms. Criswell. That's a big one. Uh, she, she's a, it is a big one. Uh, but we, you know, we are no longer doing that type uh, of adjusting. So hopefully we will not, we won't have that. Now, there will always be fraud, just like we have fraud in, uh, in disaster assistance. Uh, but we try and curtail that as much as we can. With the public's help, we can do more once that information uh, is brought to our attention. In, in fact, I'll tell you, uh, last week, I, rep I reported a fraud case through FEMA's uh, fraud, waste, and abuse uh, helpline. Yep. I have two questions, Rick Huber, city council person. Um, where are you located at there, Diana? I'm in Denver. Denver I'm, at, I'm in the regional office in Denver. You, uh, since we don't have a lot of time to really ask questions and you got to go, and thank you for your input today. Appreciate it. 
Um, do you have a problem uh, giving out your phone number to call if there's questions tomorrow or a week from now or whatever? Absolutely not. Uh, actually, <laughs> Sam's got my phone number. If she wants to post that, uh, please feel free to do so. I may refer you to the insurance agent. I don't have access to the rating engine, so I can't help on policy premiums. The All agent right. can do that, but I can talk about the theory and the basis behind that. But absolutely, that's what I'm here for. My phone number is 720-480-8338. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Yeah. So with that, I need to drop off everybody. Thank you for sitting through this. Uh, and listening to Risk Rating 2.0. If you've got any questions, you can you can call me or you can email. Um, Sam, can you provide my email address to, to everybody there? Yes, I can get something sent out. I believe we may also actually have it on our- On your website, yeah. Yes, I believe so. Um, it's also very easy to find online. So I, I want to thank you for your time. <laughs> Um, thank you, hey, everybody, and and you all have a good evening and a and a rest uh, and a a, a, a good uh, uh, flood awareness day continuation. Thank you. I, thank you. Okay, up next, rolling with it, um, Red Cross. Are you are you ready to go? We are ready to go. Hello. Let me get my video up hello hi how are you uh -huh. good how are you my name is denise